Let's talk about anemia. Anemia is something you're definitely going to see in clinical practice, and it has such a broad differential diagnosis because it could be a primary hematological problem or it could be secondary to something else. This video just serves to be a quick overview of the different types of anemia you can expect to be asked about. This is a very important topic because even though we're not going to talk about the diseases in much detail here, this video will give you a pretty good framework for how to categorize anemia in your mind. And this is a good way to help you not only net questions on step, but also have good clinical reasoning down the road. So first, let's start by defining anemia. Anemia is defined as loss of red blood cell mass. And you can measure anemia either through hemoglobin or hematocrit. A hemoglobin of less than about 12 grams per deciliter or a hematocrit of less than about 35% is clinically defined as anemia. And that's really all you need to diagnose anemia. You can actually have a completely healthy, asymptomatic patient with a hemoglobin of 10, and guess what? They're still considered anemic. So now we should talk about why do we even use hemoglobin and hematocrit to define an anemia? Well, remember that red blood cells are literally almost entirely made up of hemoglobin. So by measuring the amount of hemoglobin in the blood, you're pretty much indirectly measuring how much of the blood is made up of red blood cells. And hematocrit is just the ratio of red blood cells to the volume of blood. And so by measuring hematocrit, which is just a percentage, you get an idea of how much red blood cells there are in the blood. And normally about 40% of your blood is in red blood cells. Now that we understand the basic definition of anemia, let's talk about how we classify anemia. The easiest way to classify anemia is actually based on how big or small the red blood cells are. This is a good clinical way to organize your thoughts. Red blood cell size is measured through a lab test called MCV, or mean corpuscular volume. MCV is quite literally the average size of the cell measured in microns. A normal size is 80 to 100 microns. So a microcytic anemia, or a small red blood cell anemia, is one with an MCV less than 80. A macrocytic anemia is one with an MCV greater than 100, or big red blood cells. And a normocytic anemia is one with a normal MCV of 80 to 100. So these are normal sized red blood cells. So if you have a question stem with an anemic patient, the very first lab result you want to look at after hemoglobin and hematocrit is MCV. This will help streamline your differential diagnosis. Let's start by talking about microcytic anemias. We have an entire video dedicated to this topic, so be sure to check that out. But remember when I said that red blood cells are pretty much entirely made up of hemoglobin? Well, a microcytic anemia is an anemia with smaller red blood cells. So if the red blood cell is smaller, what do you think the problem is? Hemoglobin, right? We can remember these anemias with the mnemonic TAIL or FAST. TAIL stands for thalassemias, anemia of chronic disease, iron deficiency, and lead poisoning. And FAST is just another way to say the same thing. F stands for FE deficiency or iron deficiency, anemia of chronic disease, sideroblastic anemia. And I like that term more because it's more of a catch-all than just lead poisoning. And lastly, thalassemias. All four of these diseases share the unifying principle of some kind of hemoglobin problem. And we'll be in detail about all of these in the respective video for microcytic anemia, so don't worry too much about that right now. On the other end of the spectrum, we have macrocytic anemias. Again, we have an entire video dedicated to each specific disorder, but macrocytic anemias happen because red blood cells are released from the bone marrow too large. The most important subtype of macrocytic anemias are megaloblastic anemias. In fact, macrocytic anemias often go hand in hand with megaloblastic anemias, but they are not the same. Macrocytic just refers to the size of the red blood cell being large. However, megaloblastic anemia refers to a specific fact that the cells are blasts, also known as their immature red blood cells. Examples of a megaloblastic anemia are folate and B12 deficiency, erotic aciduria, and Fanconi's anemia. There are also non-megaloblastic forms of macrocytic anemia, and these are ones that don't form immature red blood cells. And these include diamond black vein anemia, liver disease, and alcoholism. These are pretty low yields compared to folate and B12 deficiency, and folate and B12 deficiency is actually where you should expect to get most of your questions on macrocytic anemias. And lastly, let's talk about the third part of the algorithm, which is normocytic anemias. Normocytic anemias are actually the most complicated, and that's why I've saved them for last. These anemias are anemias with a normal sized red blood cells. They're different because they have so many different etiologies, and rather than just affecting hemoglobin or affecting the prematurity of the red blood cell, they affect many different things. One way that we can categorize them is whether the disorder results in destruction of red blood cells or not. A non destructive or a non hemolytic anemia won't or cannot stimulate red blood cell production, so the reticulocyte count will be low. This is measured with a reticulocyte index less than or equal to 
Meanwhile, if the body is destroying red blood cells as the cause of the anemia, then the body will also try to compensate and create more red blood cells to replace them. This results in an increased reticulocyte count of greater than 2%. This is a way that we can clinically distinguish types of normocytic anemias. Our non-hemolytic normocytic anemias, let's break that down. Non-hemolytic normocytic anemias, as in these ones right here, include aplastic anemia, chronic kidney disease, anemia of chronic disease, and early iron deficiency. This is a pretty important distinction because we already mentioned iron deficiency fits as a microcytic anemia, but if iron deficiency is very early in the process, then it's actually non-hemolytic normocytic. Aplastic anemia and chronic kidney disease both result in decreased amounts of red blood cells because the body cannot produce red blood cells. Either the bone marrow is aplastic or the kidneys have failed to produce erythropoietin. Meanwhile, anemia of chronic disease and iron deficiency start off as a normocytic anemia, but they progress to microcytic. Either way, neither anemia of chronic disease nor iron deficiency results in breakdown of red blood cells, but rather the red blood cells just shrink. So there's nothing really telling the body to produce more red blood cells. In reality, this is an oversimplification, but it helps us understand why these disorders all have a low reticulocyte count. Then on the other end of the spectrum, we have our hemolytic normocytic anemias. These are pretty much disorders that result in red blood cell destruction, and they can further be categorized in intrinsic, which is pretty much there's something fundamentally within the red blood cell, either structurally or functionally, that causes it to break, or extrinsic, something outside of the red blood cell causing it to break. Intrinsic red blood cell disorders include things like hereditary spherocytosis, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, and in both of these, red blood cell has an unusual physical form that causes it to break down. Then there's also a glucose 6-phosphate deficiency or pyruvate kinase deficiency, in which case the red blood cell has defective enzymes that cause it to break down. Or you can also have hemoglobin disorders like sickle cell disease or hemoglobin C disease. Now, the unifying factor about all of these is that there's something fundamentally internally wrong with the red blood cell that causes it to break down. So it's intrinsic because there's something internal going on, hemolytic because it results in the breakdown of cells, which stimulates a higher reticulocyte index, and it's normocytic because the size of the red blood cell doesn't really change. And then lastly, we have extrinsic hemolytic anemias, and these are autoimmune hemolytic anemia, micro and macroangiopathic hemolytic anemias, and some infections can also cause hemolysis. Again, we will discuss all of these subtopics, all of these subcategories in their own respective videos. So if you don't have a good grasp of these things right now, then you can always check out those individual videos in the Hemonc chapter. And let's end this video with the flash quiz. Let's try to figure out what different lab values we can attribute to different types of anemia. So for folate deficiency, you'd have a low hemoglobin, a low hematocrit, and an MCV greater than 100. For beta thalassemia, what would you expect? That's right, a low hemoglobin, a low hematocrit, and an MCV less than 80. This is because folate deficiency, if you remember, is a macrocytic anemia, and beta thalassemia is a microcytic anemia. By the way, how would you subcategorize folate deficiency? That's right, it's a megaloblastic anemia. Next one up, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. This would have a low hemoglobin, a low hematocrit, a normal MCV of 80 to 100, and a high reticulocyte index greater than 2%. So just as a refresher, how would you categorize this? That's right, it's an intrinsic hemolytic normocytic anemia. I know that's a mouthful, but it's good review. And then lastly, for iron deficiency anemia. Well, this is a bit of a trick question. So we know it's going to have a low hemoglobin and low hematocrit, and the MCV is either going to be less than 80, in which case it's a microcytic anemia, or if it's very, very early in the anemia, then it'll be a normal MCV of 80 to 100 with a reticulocyte index less than 2%. And that corresponds to a non-hemolytic normocytic anemia. Well, that's really all we have for anemias. I know it was a pretty long video, but again, this just serves as an overview, and if you want to cover the specific topics in detail, then each of these subcategories are covered in their own videos. So that's it for this overview video. If you like this video, then please be sure to leave us a thumbs up. Thank you.